2,000 years ago, thousands and thousands of kilometers away, a man lifted his eyes and said a prayer in front of his friends. Later, one of them wrote it down. So what? Last week, we started looking at John 17, which is the longest prayer Jesus has recorded as praying in John's Gospel. It's known as the High Priestly Prayer. It's the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples, the people he'd been, who'd been following him in his long ministry, not long ministry, his not long ministry of three years. What people pray reveals what they believe about themselves, about God, and about those they're praying for. So I want to focus today on this very famous prayer, on one aspect in particular that jumped out at me when I was looking at it. But what it reveals about what Jesus believed about his disciples, which was that they had an identity or a citizenship that wasn't of the world. If, as believers in Christ, we find ourselves feeling alienated from the world, just we just don't seem to fit, it just doesn't seem to make sense. This prayer, Jesus' prayer for his disciples, can give us comfort, can actually give us something to get excited about, and can also give us a challenge. What Jesus prays in this section of this prayer, which we started looking at last week, shows that he believes that his disciples are no longer part of the earthly order. They're now aliens. They belong somewhere else, where Jesus belongs. Something about receiving and believing Jesus has fundamentally changed their identity. They've become a different kind of creature. Now we see this idea back in chapter 3 of this gospel where Jesus is speaking with one of Israel's teachers, Nicodemus, who comes to see him in secret to find out more about what he's been teaching. And Jesus tells him that to see the kingdom of God requires being born again. And Jesus has a rebuke for those who refuse to believe. He says, very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen but you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Jesus came to do his work, but for those who didn't believe or receive it, they remained unchanged. But those who did believe and receive it were changed, were born again. By believing and receiving Christ as the Son of God and his teaching and his words as those of God, we become new creatures, no longer natives of earth. And the way that Jesus prays here shows us that for him, receiving and believing him makes us like him. No longer part of the world he came to, but connected to the world that he was, the heavenly world, the heavenly realm that he was returning to. Earlier in this gospel, he'd already hinted that he was going to prepare a place for his disciples and that he'd come back to take them to be there with him. Paul speaks about this in 2 Corinthians where he says, From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. So this connection between Jesus and those who believe in him is what drives this prayer for them. This is what drives his concern for them to be protected by the word of God, the truth. Even the word truth is a strange word now, isn't it? It's a bit of a dynamite word, a bit of a hand grenade of a word in polite conversation because truth is whatever we want it to be. 
but for us the truth is Jesus Christ. Let's set the context, particularly if you haven't been following in, in this series which we started last week. So this prayer happens just before Jesus' arrest, in his last time with his disciples. You could say in the lull before the storm, in the wings before he goes onto the stage of his final few hours on the earth. He knows his arrest is imminent. Judas, the one who's going to betray him, has just gone off to get the soldiers and the others who are coming to take him away. And he's just explained, Jesus has just explained to his followers that he will be going back to God and that they can expect trouble. These followers are very vulnerable. They're scared. They're about to be scattered. They're about to run away when they realize what his words actually mean. But these are the same followers who will build the church. And they're marked people. They're marked men and women because they've been with Jesus. They can't just blend in anymore. Contact with him has changed them forever. So in the first five verses of this chapter, he prays for himself. He prays for the mission that he's been sent on by God to go forward, for God to be glorified in his exaltation, which we learned last week didn't mean being paraded through the streets in a fantastic parade of glory, but actually meant being hoisted up on a cross for crucifixion. So in today's passage, he's praying for his disciples, having prayed for himself. And so he begins in verse 6, the beginning of our section today, saying, I revealed that name that you gave me to reveal to them. And by that, by the name he means, the character, the nature, the attributes of the God of the patriarchs. We know this idea from branding, don't we? The name of a company kind of carries, connotes the, the qualities of that company. The name of God carries the qualities of God. And he made his name known to them through his teaching, through the examples, the signs he performed during his ministry. And unlike the unbelieving teachers of Israel that Jesus rebuked in his conversation with Nicodemus, they believed and they kept and they followed his teaching. They took on the words that Jesus gave them, as he says in verses 6 to 8. These are men and women who left behind boats and fields and family and livelihoods and respectability to follow Jesus. The one who the scholar Leon Morris says enlarged their concept of God. Over time, these people came to recognize that Jesus' teachings came from God. They took him and his words to heart. And so Jesus says, he kept them safe by the name that he revealed to them, the nature and the character of God. There are echoes here in what he says from the Psalms, Psalm 61, Psalm 18, Psalm 144, many others which refer to the name of the Lord as a strong tower, keeping the righteous safe. Even the name that he came with, the name Jesus, means Jesus saves. What's also clear from his prayer is that God always makes the first move in a person's journey to believing. Those of us here who call ourselves Christians didn't just wake up one morning and think, oh, it's Tuesday, I think I'll become a Christian today. Neither did these disciples. In chapter 6 of this gospel, John makes it clear that no one can come to the Father unless the Father first draws them. God's love acts first to draw us to him. God chooses us and we respond. The disciples were known by God and God enabled them to respond with him. It's a mystery that many scholars have spent many, many years, decades, centuries poring over. We choose God because he first chose us.
Jesus was able to guard his disciples by the name that he gave them. But there was one who was lost, the one called the son of lostness, the one whose inclination was to wander. This is Judas, who followed his own desires, which led him to betray Jesus. And in that same mystery, knowing this, God's purposes were served as Judas's actions steered him, steered Jesus to the cross. This conundrum of God's sovereignty and man's free will could keep us in this verse for hours, but not today. It's enough to say that both God's perfect foreknowledge and Judas's free will combined to put Jesus on the cross, which was necessary for our salvation. The way Jesus prays shows that he believes that the disciples are not like the rest of the world, they're more like him. And there's a little word, little Greek verb, adverb kathos, which means just as. And we see it occurring in verse 11 when he prays for them, the disciples, to be one just as we are one, meaning him and the Father. And also in verse 14 where he says, I gave them your word and the world hated them because they are not in the world just as I am not of the world. He doesn't pray for the world as Carrie was telling the children earlier, which might be surprising. You might think that Jesus would pray for the world. You know, he's supposed to love the world, isn't he? Instead of praying for the world, he prays for the disciples who are just like him, not of the world. These disciples are his first fruits, his first harvest of believers, his trophy, his glory, as he says in verse 10. I'm glorified in them, he says. He doesn't pray for the world, not because he doesn't love the world. He is about to demonstrate his love for the world in glorious technicolor. But because he's sending them into the world. He won't pray for sinfulness to flourish, which is what the world represents. The sinful, humanistic systems of life that ignore God and reject his right to rule. Instead, he prays for his disciples, the ones he's sending, just as he was sent, because they are also connected to his mission. They're the ones that are, carry, that are going to carry it forward. His words fold them into his life with the same language of sending and being sent, being sanctified and becoming like him. Jesus asks God to do what only he, God, can Human beings cannot make or keep themselves holy. By Jesus' death and God's continuing work in our lives by his word, Father and Son are, to quote Leon Morris again, united in the act of saving those who had no way of saving themselves. Last week, I think, I hope you remember, I'd showed that Jesus had decided to sacrifice himself. It was a done deal. It was his settled will. And he repeats that settledness again. His will to sacrifice himself. And the word that he uses is the same word that's used for the perfect, spotless animals given for sacrificial offerings in the Old Testament. His gruesome, humiliating death, which he goes to willingly, makes the cross an instrument of torture, the symbol of Jesus' supreme victory, not by military might, but by self-giving on behalf of others through a death that was not able to defeat him. What people pray and how they pray reveals what they believe about God, about themselves, and about those they pray for. And what Jesus prays in this section of this prayer shows that he believes that his disciples are no longer part of the earthly order. They are now aliens belonging elsewhere, 
where Jesus belongs. Something about receiving and believing Jesus has fundamentally changed their identity. They have become a different kind of creature. If as believers we find ourselves feeling alienated in our workplaces, our schools, the places we hang out, our social gatherings, at the dinner table, when people bring up particular subjects, this prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples offers us comfort, something to be excited about and a challenge. Let me tell you why. I think there's comfort for our discomfort. Because if we feel like the world is going crazy around us and it just doesn't make any sense, we should be relieved. We need to be careful if we're believers of feeling too at home here. We're not meant to feel at home here. We're not from here. Not since we believed and received the gospel of Christ. The church is not meant to be mainstream. <clears throat> Jesus himself says in verse 14 that the disciples would be hated because of the word he gave them. No servant is greater than their master. If they hated him, they will also hate us. The world, the powers that be, the wider community of Jesus' earthly life did not invite him to consult on their laws, redirect their communities, sort out their society, balance the economy. They crucified him. We should not expect to be loved, understood, or even liked by the world. We will be assailed and assaulted by all kinds of evil. And we are, aren't we? It's all part of the deal. We should not be surprised by the things that happen to us and around us. We should not be surprised if we're tempted by them. Jesus promised that we would have trouble, but he also said to take heart. And that's why I say, I believe that we can have some comfort in our discomfort because it fits absolutely with what Jesus says and prays for us as disciples. I think there's room for some excitement as well. Because Jesus himself speaks of the disciples having something he calls his full, fully fulfilled joy. Because he anticipates having done everything necessary to repair the breach in our relationship with God. We now, as believers, have Jesus living within us permanently and without interruption. Whether or not we even grasp what that means if it's something Jesus was excited and joyful about, maybe we should be too. If we've never thought about it, I invite you to explore that thought that Jesus is living on the inside of you. If we're not part of here, then we're part of somewhere much better, a new heavens and a new earth the Father's house, a place of no more tears, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. We have so much to look forward to. This is not all that there is. And if we're not from here, we don't have to fit in with the world system, be subject to its anxieties, its obsessions with status or money or ambition or reputation or youth or legacy. We are free to love God, to be our kooky, Jesus-loving selves. We can smile in the traffic. We can refuse to play by the world's rules. We can let his streams of living water flow from within, just as he promised. We can enjoy God in front of people and use every opportunity to be ministers of reconciliation. God's beautiful alternative to the anxiety, stress, and anger of the world that sin has built. And there's also a challenge. Because what I just described might sound blissful to some of you and balmy to the rest of you. 
It might sound like some kind of wishful thinking where there are no bills to pay, no sickness, no trouble, no aging, no adversity. Definitely not. But either we believe Jesus or we don't. That's the challenge. Ongoingly. I know that's not a good word. It's not a good English word. But I think you hear me. It's not a one and done. It's not I believed when I became a Christian and then that carries you for the rest of your life. It's a daily, sometimes in really bad situations, hourly decision to believe. It's not a feeling. We are not to think that belief is a feeling. I was sitting in a doctor's rooms the other day uh, and he asked me what I did for a living I'm a new minister for those of you who don't know me I'm fairly new at this so it's, it's still a new and a really interesting experience when I tell people what I do for a living because I get a bit of a shock when I say it too <laughs> uh, and he went oh oh well I'm an atheist I don't think I could ever believe that stuff and I thought yeah he thinks it's a feeling too but it's not a feeling, it's a decision. The best decision we make every day is to believe, not just that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, but that he rose for our justification. Because Jesus went through with it, we are no longer subject to the fear of death, because death is no longer the final word. Jesus is. Jesus speaks in this prayer of the disciples keeping his word, that is taking on his word and living it. They took the word Jesus spoke and knew truly that he had been sent from God. So let me ask you, what word do you take on board regularly? If you have a regular practice of Bible reading, do you take a verse to ponder throughout the day and apply it to your life? When I was at Sunday school, they used to speak of having a fighting verse for the week. I suggest this might be a practice for you. Take on a verse with which you will fight, a verse with which you will protect yourself during the day. As Kerry was holding up the Bible as our protection, it really is. It's not just for the kids. It's for all of us. If you don't have a daily practice or a regular practice of Bible study, can I encourage you to start one? Start here. Read this prayer, John 17. Read the section we did today. Read it again. And home in on a verse that speaks to you. There will be one. There is always something that speaks to us. And learn it. Use it as a declaration of faith each day. Because we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's be encouraged, stimulated and challenged by the way Jesus sees and prays for his disciples. Here, but not from here. Citizens of another realm for whom Jesus himself stopped to pray on his way to death for our sakes. Let's be encouraged. We're not from here, so we're not going to feel comfortable here. Let's get excited, because we're from somewhere infinitely better. And let's take on the challenge of believing Jesus daily.